We're the King James translators, King James only. We're going to look at a phrase in the preface to the King James, in which the King James translators refer to their work as one principal good one among English Bible translations. And I've got an expert in the history of the King James. In fact, the proprietor of kjbhistory.com, Tim Berg, along with me today, my good friend from the Textual Confidence Collective. Tim, how are you? I'm doing great, Mark, and it's great to be able to sit down here and chat with you again. Let's set up the question. Let's try to jump right in, as we often do, and as we often don't do on this channel. My intros are too long, <laughs> too often, I'm afraid. But let me frame the question here by simply reading through the portion of the preface that's relevant. I've got it up here on my screen, got it highlighted in Logos Bible Software. Truly good Christian reader, we never thought from the beginning that we should need to make a new translation nor yet to make of a bad one a good one. For then the imputation of Sixtus had been true in some sort, that our people had been fed with gall of dragons instead of wine, with whey instead of milk. They're saying our goal was to make a good one better, or out of many good ones, one principal good one, not justly to be accepted against. That hath been our endeavor, that our mark. And the reason we're talking here today is that regularly in online discussion, what other kind of discussion is there when it comes to King James <laughs> only views? Um, Tim and I both encounter folks following people like E.F. Hills or Lawrence M. Vance, you know, major figures, writers in the King James only worlds, plural, who's, who point to this section of the preface and say, in essence, the King James translators were King James only, or we ought to be King James only because the King James translators succeeded in their goal, which was to make one principal good one that was you know, not justly to be accepted against. In other words, this little highlighted portion of the preface gets used for the promotion of King James only. We don't think that's right. Tim's going to help us to understand the historical circumstances that surrounded the creation of the King James Version and therefore to help us understand this key paragraph within it. So in a way, Tim, I can just have you take off with it. What, where do you start as a historian, a historian of the King James Version in particular, in understanding the meaning of uh, this paragraph? And you know, by the way, at the end, actually, we're going to get into my uh, philology stuff. We're going to just take a look at a couple of the difficult words and phrases. But let's talk about the history first. Where do you start, Tim? Yeah, well, the best place to start, especially for those of us who are outside of the Anglican Communion, as it's called today, um, is to get a good grasp of the English Reformation. Um, anyone familiar, of course, with Reformation history understands Luther in 1517 nailing the... Actually, he didn't personally nail them. He mailed them in, um, and someone there would have nailed them. So all the pictures that you've seen of the hammer and the nail in the list are wrong. Uh, but someone nailed the 95 Thesis of Luther to the door in Wittenberg, Germany. Um, and what was intended as a debate turns into this massive rift in the church about where the locus of authority should be found and what exactly justification means and all those related issues. Um, what a lot of people that are familiar with the Reformation don't realize is that Reformation on the continent, as it spread out from Germany, um, began primarily as a theological issue. It was all about the theology. But when Reformation came to England what we call the English Reformation, much later, by the way, so uh, at least a decade later, it came in a very different shape. It came to England first for political and personal reasons and only secondarily for th theological ones. And that was because King Henry VIII um, wanted to get a divorce or an annulment of his marriage to Catherine of Aragon. And the Pope would not allow it because divorce is illegal uh, or, or just not accepted in the canons of the Roman Catholic Church. And so as this Reformation was taking off, Henry thought, oh, I'll join that thing. And instead of the Pope being the head of my church, I'll be the head of my church. And all of a sudden, as that, I say suddenly, it took several decades to develop, the situation developed in the Church of England where the king, rather than the Pope, was the head of the church. So what happened was the Church of England ended at a spot that was really hesitantly Protestant, might be one way to put it. They, they got yeah. there by fits and starts. And there was right. a lot of debate about what that should look like. Um, and two basic party lines developed, what we refer to as conformist and nonconformist. And the word conform refers to the Elizabethan settlement of religion that happens after Henry um, and his uh, third child's reign, where they finally settled down and said, okay, here's what the Church of England is going to look like from this point forward. The Church of England is going to be Protestant in its doctrine when it comes to justification by faith, 
belief in the authority of scripture and so on, we're going to hold to Protestant doctrines. But we're still retaining a lot of the Catholic ceremony, liturgy, and tradition in the shape of our church. So for example, the Church of England is the only Protestant church in the world that still has episcopy with bishops and still has uh, bishops that wear these thick vestments, special robes for all their liturgical functions, and that still has a very scripted liturgy. If you're familiar with traditional right. uh, Roman Catholic liturgy and the Latin uh, Missal, uh, a priest would come and he actually had to carry about seven or eight different books to shape through what ministry was supposed to look like as people came to church every day. And there were you know, eight hours of prayer, eight specific designated times of prayer uh, throughout the day, and then specific readings from the Latin Vulgate. Well, under Cramner, that became in the Church of England reduced a little bit, but still present. And it became in English, which was a massive shift where the service right. was no longer in Latin, but right. it was still heavily scripted. So they developed under Cramner. Very liturgical. Uh, what we refer to. Yeah, very liturgical. What we refer to as the Book of Common Prayer. And I'll hold up what is, I think, the best uh, historical critical edition if you want to get one. There are hundreds of editions of the Book of Common Prayer, but this one by Cummings. And, and there's all one from my uh, acquaintance from school, Sam Bray, that he did with IVP mm -hmm. in the last year or two, which actually updates the False Friends. I'm hoping to do a video oh, really? on that at some point, but go ahead, oh, continue. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, no, and I love the BCP. When we got married, we took our liturgy directly from the 1549 BCP because uh, I, I just love it. I love what was done. And I'm not an Anglican. Well, it has uh, the classic phrases that we all know, at least from television, if not from actual weddings that we've <laughs> right. been to. And even know, in to most wedding ceremonies, we... Forward. Right, we yeah, still use it. Yeah, exactly. Most of the wedding ceremonies that traditionally are used today, a lot of those phrases come from the Book of right. Common Prayer. So I'm, I'm a nerd, and I was like, babe, what if we just went yeah. and used, like, Cramners? <laughs> and she had to adjust to me pledging my troth uh, to her. Yeah. Um, but we, we had a blast, and it was Did you say, really with my body, I thee worship? I did. I actually love that phrase. Not the subject here, but I would be happy to defend it for someone. Yeah. Sam Storms, my pastor, defended it for years. Interesting. We'll have to talk about that in a, in a separate mm -hmm. one. That was where the pastor, because I did something similar with the pastor of the little independent oh, really? Baptist church where we got married, objected to that phrase, and I decided not to fight it. Anyway, sure. Book sure. of Common Prayer, more liturgical. You, you know, the, it's commonly understood. The Anglican church is something of a via media. That, that's a, a right. phrase that I often associate with it. And Although in, we do have, I will say, if I can interject there for a second, we do have to be very careful with the phrase via media. One of the things that uh, Dermot McCulloch showed in his massive biography of Thomas Cramner. Yeah, I read that. Uh, if that shows up. Yeah, beautiful. He shows at the very end that while today we think of the Anglican church as a via media, media between Protestantism and Anglicanism, right. that wasn't what Cramner Catholic, himself Catholicism. intended. Yeah, sorry, Catholicism. That wasn't what Cramner himself intended. He intended a Protestant via media between Genevan Reformation that had gone much, much, strong, much more strongly and Reformation as it was taking place there. Uh, so a little bit different shape of the word, but yes, very much a church reformed in doctrine, but Catholic in liturgy. Right. Got it. Okay. So we're setting up the historical circumstances in which the preface was written. And I know you've done a ton of work on how those historical circumstances work together to actually produce the King James Bible. So let's go on in the story a little bit. Let's keep going until we can get to really explicating, explaining this paragraph in the preface. I'll just let you keep going. Yeah, so maybe the next step then, once we understand English Reformation, would be to look specifically at the Hampton Court Conference. When James took the throne, that via media, that Elizabeth settlement had been in place for a long time, um, and it was the first real peace that England had known uh, from a religious perspective in quite a while. So when James came to the throne in 1603, Everybody was excited that maybe now was their chance to influence the king and finally make the church the shape that it wanted to be. So that conformist, nonconformist divide, and we sometimes use the word Puritan to describe those nonconformists. That's technically just one small subset of them. Um, and it's a hugely debated term. Uh, but right. that, that divide kind of reignited as James took the throne. And a group of Puritans approached James with what was known as the millinery petition and said, basically, hey, we've got all these Protestant Puritan concerns we don't think the church in England has fully reformed yet, and we want it to further the Reformation. Can we talk about this? Well, James was a master diplomat and a huge um, supporter of the cause of peace, at least in his kingdom where he was going to be in charge, and he was the one that had to deal with it. So he called the Hampton Court Conference. There were some confusions about the date, but it ended up being a three-day conference on three non-consecutive days on Saturday, Monday, and Wednesday in January of 1604. On the second day of that conference, 
the four Puritan spokesmen who were there representing the Puritan party, probably not representing them well, and certainly not representing them by a majority. They were vastly outnumbered by the conformist side. Um, but James gave them a chance to sort of air their concerns. And as they aired their concerns one by one by one, and I've traced through all of this on my website if someone wants to go and look at all the details, they got rejected time after time after time after time. Until towards the end of the day, they made a request that, by the way, was not mentioned anywhere in the millinery petition, despite the fact that one prominent book by a King James only author that I won't mention, uh, who just did a terrible job with the history. He claims that a thousand people signed this document, all wanting a new Bible. Actually, the Bible's not even mentioned in the millinery petition. And it's not, we have about a dozen list of Puritan agendas for the conference as they were kind of talking and debating about what they wanted. None of those mention a new Bible. It would really could, seem like could the you idea... pause and mm -hmm. talk about the kinds of things just real generally that they were asking for then? Yeah, absolutely. So throughout the millinery petition, what they're primarily seeking is to change this Elizabethan settlement where everything is highly scripted liturgy and priests are still wearing vestments. So they're complaining about priests having to wear vestments. Uh, some complaint is raised about the very idea of bishops, that threefold order in the church. And maybe we should take just a moment to explain what that is. Um, those of us familiar with the KJV and raised on it probably just interpret the word bishop to mean pastor and right. think, oh, that's just another word for pastor. In the church, if of any England, man that's desire not the, the office of a bishop, he desireth a good thing. That's always yeah. applied in King James only circles to the office of pastor. Exactly. And I did that myself growing up all the time and didn't realize that in the Church of England, there's a very distinct threefold structure of ministry that's been around since at least the medieval era. Some some would say it actually goes back to the fourth or fifth or sixth century. And it is that you have deacons at the lowest level of ordained ministry serving in a particular local church, not necessarily the way most deacons in the free church movement, like I'm a part of, serve, uh, but an official ordained ministry. A step above that is priest, and usually you become a deacon first and then a priest. A priest is over a particular parish church. So in England, I guess I should explain that too. In England, the entire area of the England is divided into two provinces, a northern and a southern province. Those provinces are divided into smaller subunits known as a diocese. And there's, yeah. at the time the King dioceses. James was created, there was about 20, I think 26, 27 of those dioceses. I'm not sure I'm saying the plural right, dioceses? dioceses? I usually, I think it's, it's it's a schwa on the O, it's like schwa. diocese, I think. So it's like an unaccented syllable. You don't say di-o, you say diocese. That's what I've always heard. Diocese. Okay, see, I learned Di more uh, like stuff di every time we talk. Philologist Diocese. here. Yeah, my, yeah, my knowledge great. is comparatively <laughs> not worth having compared to what you're sharing with us, but I, at least oh, I can contribute helpful. that. Yeah. Well, yeah, so, so they're, to explain that they're structure, objecting you've got parishes, to churches. that structure. Yeah, they, they are opposed to that structure, and they're very opposed to the idea, most of them opposed to the idea of bishops, because you have this parish, and in that parish, you don't get to choose what church you go to. You go to the church that's in your particular local geographical area. And there were about 9,000 parish churches in England at the time uh, of the King James. There were about 25, 26 bishops. So a bishop is one step above and it's like this administrative function. You do some preaching, but mostly you're kind of a pastor of pastors, so to speak. And you'll have maybe a thousand or 2,000 priests underneath you and you sort of just shepherd them. Um, and all the priests then have to answer to them. And then those bishops answer to an archbishop. There are two archbishops, one of Canterbury and one of York. Um, so that structure, very, very heavily political, was a part of the shape of the church in England. And the Puritans just didn't like that. They didn't like the fact that the Apocrypha was, as part of the BCP, constantly read in the service. So you'd come to church and some of the readings would be Old Testament, some would be New Testament, some would be Apocrypha. And that really bothered the Puritans, that, that type of thing. They, they wanted England to look more like Geneva. That's the simple way to right. say it. Right. So, so these, broadly speaking the Puritans are going to be more similar to today's average King James only, as I mean, it sounds funny to say, but in, in doctrine, you're going to, if you're going to read that history as an independent fundamental Baptist, you're going to be rooting, if you're going to be rooting for either side, you're going to be rooting for the Puritan side. But if you read oh, yeah. enough, you read carefully, you're going to see a number of points where the Puritans aren't exactly with you. Uh, let's talk <laughs> sure. super briefly about that. What would your average independent fundamental Baptist King James only is see in the Puritans to say, uh, that's not where I'm at. Yeah. Uh, in the Puritans or in the conformist? In the Puritans. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So um, most IFB churches are, not all of them, but most of them are rather stringently anti-Calvinist. Um, whereas Puritans, almost without exception, held to a very high conformist shape. 
Um, because they were part of the Church of England, there was some debate about baptism. But because they were part of the Church of England, the Church of England itself uh, holds to uh, baptism of generation. Yeah, and oh, baptism mm-hmm. of infants, stated directly in the 39 Articles, which was, which is one of the other formularies of the Church of England. Uh, so the Puritans, for the most part, were on board with that. Um, you've got a very high view of the Eucharist. Again, that's more on the conformist than the nonconformist side, but it's, right. very, it's present. So someone like Lancelot Andrews, a King James translator, believes very firmly that when you take the Eucharist, and states directly, that's where you find forgiveness of sins. Your sins are forgiven. Uh, Christ meets with you. He, he's present in the Eucharist. It's not symbolism. It's not memorialism or what uh, Michael Bird calls the doctrine of the real absence. <laughs> you know, they, they would yeah. have rejected that completely. <laughs> uh, oh, Christ, he's Christ hilarious. is present in the sacrament. Oh, yeah, he's great with words. His systematic theology yeah. is probably my favorite just because of the way he talks. <laughs> uh, yeah. So great yeah. with phrases. He even um, yeah, all those things would be accent. foreign. Sorry. He even writes with an Australian accent. That was an obscure joke. You know, uh, the reason I asked that, I'm just trying to get listeners who really don't understand the history. And you've taught me so much about the history. I've read books. I was at the Museum of the Bible just recently, and their question at the Q&A session, I gave a little interview, was, have you read Adam Nicholson's God's Secretaries? And thankfully, she picked a book mm-hmm. that I had read, but you've read so much more on the King James history. Yeah, I'm saying I've communicated that, some with Nicholson. Yeah, oh, neat. I'm, I'm pointing out that no matter who you are today, if, if you're interested in this channel, more than likely... You will have some affinities with one or more of the parties in the uh, in the disputes that were involved there in the Church of England at the time, but you're not going to map yourself really readily and easily, certainly onto either party, but even the Puritans right. that are more similar, I would say, just at, at heart to what I was taught at my uh, King James Only Church in high school. Uh, and that's just a reminder to everybody, you, you can't just assume... <laughs> that the concerns that were driving them are the concerns that are driving you. So let's get back to the the main road here, the highway. You were saying that the millinery petition actually did not include a request for a new Bible translation, but at the end of the Hampton Court Conference, almost as an afterthought, I don't know, you continue mm-hmm. there. Yeah. How did the King James uh, idea come up? Yeah, I think it was kind of an afterthought. My, my personal view is, and there are a few scholars who disagree, I don't think that anybody walked into the Hampton Court Conference intending to talk about a new Bible. I think Hmm. it was something that at the last minute, um, Reynolds came up with the idea, probably from Thomas Spark, who had used this exact uh, tactic before in some of his previous arguments with conformists. Um, And he later claimed he had always been a conformist, which he wasn't. Um, But they had taken this tactic of saying, "How? well, hey, we want the Book of Common Prayer revised, but we're not making any headway there. But the Book of Common Prayer regularly employs the Great Bible or Coverdale or bishops. Um, And so if we get them convinced that those Bibles contain translation errors, corruptions is the word that they would use, now they have to revise the BCP. They have to say, okay, it's okay, we'll make some changes to the Book of Common Prayer because the Bible translation in it needs to be revised. So I think that's what probably motivated the original request. I don't think it was a genuine request for a new Bible. It was a tactic. And by the way, that's what Smith says in the preface to the King James Bible. If you go on down below where we're reading and read his summary of Hampton Court, he calls it a poor and empty shift, (laughs) meaning a a strategy. I I think I quoted him right there. It's a like last ditch Hail Mary strategy to get the Book of Common Prayer approved was to suggest a new Bible. They probably didn't really want one. And I'm paraphrasing him now. He says, you probably didn't really want it, but you asked for it. So now you're stuck with it. (laughs) I I can Uh, read here. And Although this was judged to be but a very poor and empty shift, yet even hereupon did his majesty begin to bethink himself of the good that might ensue by a new translation, and presently after gave order for this translation, which is now presented unto thee, thus much to satisfy our scrupulous reverence. So so help me understand this. Mm. This was judged to be but a very poor and empty shift. Explain yeah. again, what, what does that mean? What is it referring to? Yeah, so shift, it's kind of an archaic use of that word. It means a strategy. And notice he speaks specifically speaks of the scrupulous brethren. That's a phrase to refer to the hotter kind of Protestant, as one scholar called them, the Puritans. He's, he's talking about those more uh, Genevan-minded reformers. And he says that at Hampton Court, when they asked for a new Bible, it was actually a last-ditch Hail Mary in their ultimate campaign to get the Book of Common Prayer revised. They weren't really asking for a new Bible. They wanted the Book of Common Prayer revised. But since they hadn't gotten anywhere all day (laughs) asking again and again and again for that to happen, their last ditch effort was to say, oh, well, the translation is is corrupt, so we have to revise it. And that ultimately succeeded with James um, and got the idea of a new Bible to push forward. 
while you were talking, I was looking up the word shift and uh, best I can tell, uh, because the new OED site keeps booting me out and won't let me log mm. in permanently, and it's like absolutely killing me. I've got to get this oh, fixed because no, I use the OED so often. A movement to do something, a beginning. Um, and I can see how that could be something like strategy. Wow, that is fascinating. And I've read that paragraph and kind of struggled over it. And I, I got the broad outlines, but you're helping me get to the details. So let's get back to the details uh, of the paragraph that we're focusing on. Uh, we come to this, this paragraph. They want to make uh, let's see here. I've got it up here again. True, the good Christian reader. We never thought from the beginning that we should need to make a new translation, nor yet to make of a bad one a good one, but to make a good one better, or out of many good ones, one principal good one. So let's let's move it back to the main storyline. What else do we need to know about the history in order to understand this paragraph? Yeah. So just to zoom in a little bit more, I think the because there had in the past been kind of a divide between Bible versions. Uh, Puritans tended to love the Geneva Bible, not always, and conformists tended to love the Bishop's Bible, not always, and not necessarily strictly. Um, there was this debate about what should be used in liturgy. I do think Cameron McKenzie's excellent dissertation has shown that the Geneva Bible was sort of de facto an approved version in the Church of England. So the debate wasn't necessarily over whether the Geneva Bible could be used. Uh, David Norton argued that years ago and convinced a lot of people that what Reynolds was really trying to do is say, hey, I'll make this objection and then the Geneva Bible will get accepted. Well, actually, the Geneva Bible was already accepted. Uh, there, was, there was some looseness in liturgy, and there were already some churches using the Geneva Bible in liturgy and had been during all of Archbishop John Whitgift's primacy. Um, so what was really going on here was, as the request gets made and then accepted, from James's perspective, this is an opportunity to set up one translation as the Bible used in liturgy. In other words, when you come to church, nobody cared what you read at home. Nobody cared when you were preaching what you quoted from. Lancelot Andrews, for example, well after the King James is translated, constantly cites from his own translation of Latin, Greek, and Hebrew differing from the King James on a regular basis. Like, he does that in every sermon. You can't pick up a Lancelot Andrews sermon and not find him correcting the King James Bible. He doesn't say, I'm correcting this Bible, but quoting uh, in a way that's different. There was no objection to that. But when it came to the scripted liturgy from the Book of Common Prayer, James had decided, oh, this is a perfect opportunity will create a new translation specifically within the Church of England and try to heal the divide between conformist and nonconformist, and everybody will then be bound to this one particular Bible in public liturgy. That is the ambition for the King James Bible. And I think we mentioned the other day in a video, but I want to mention just again, um, a really good place where that shows up is in Patrick Galloway's uh, discussion of the Hampton Court Conference. Patrick Galloway was a Scotsman who came with James for his ascension to England and then went back to Scotland. He was at the Hampton Court Conference and he wrote a letter back home shortly after the conference. He wrote it on 10 February 1604 and sent it to the Presbytery of Edinburgh, Edinburgh um, where it was read about two weeks later. And when it was read, they discussed this phrase where he talked about the translation and what it was supposed to be. And here's the phrase that Patrick Galloway, an eyewitness account um, of the Hampton Court Conference. And by the way, not just an eyewitness account, but before he sent that letter, he actually checked with James and said, hey, can you look over this list that I have of what took place and make sure it's accurate? And so James personally looked at, read over, and approved of this list. So this is a royally approved statement of what the purpose of the King James Bible would be. Here it is. Of the translation, Galloway records the decision that, and I quote, a translation be made of the whole Bible as consonant as can be to the original Hebrew and Greek, and this to be set out and printed without any marginal notes, and only to be used in all churches of England in divine service, or one later edition adds, in time of divine service. So notice how restricted and narrow that purpose right. is. Right. It's not just, oh, we're going to make a new Bible and it's what everybody's going to use for everything. No, no, no. This is the right. Bible for time of divine service. And divine service is a technical phrase that means when the priest puts on his vestments to do baptism or Eucharist or public reading from the scripture in the BCP, when he's engaged in that specifically priestly approved duty in public liturgy, he needs to use the King James Bible. That, and that we, is the purpose behind it. And this is the meat. This is what we're getting to. And if you've persisted this long in this discussion, this is the payoff, the climax, okay? As we read this today, 
even I, when I first was reading this paragraph without full understanding of the history, felt like they were kind of boasting. We're going to make one principal good one. We really are going to make the best English Bible translation. And of course, if you're going to make a revision, who doesn't set out to do the very best work that you can do? There's not necessarily sure. anything wrong with that. Um, but to further say, therefore, this is permanently the best one for all mm -hmm. uses. And to even further say, this is the only one that we should use, so radically misunderstands the purpose of the King James translators in saying these words as to actually violate them. No, that mm -hmm. we never entered their minds that right. they're actually that, that they'd be uh, that their work would be used and these words would be used to try to shove aside all other English Bible translations. They did not do that in their personal practice. They that doesn't fit with other things that they say about other Bible translations in this very paragraph. To out of many good ones, one principal good one. Why in the world would they call them good ones plural? <laughs> That's good. Even if they're going to go on to say a principal good one if they don't mean that there's some use, some good that can come out of these translations. Uh, I think that you've nailed it, Tim. You've helped me, and I'm certain that you've helped others. I think you and I can, in any circumstance, keep talking about the King James Version for a super, super long time. <laughs> so I want to sure. move to right to the philology portion and mm -hmm. then give, give you a chance. Of course, you can jump in at any point in the philology, but... Um, and at the end, give you a chance to uh, hit anything that in the history that you think we uh, might need to add. But let's just yeah. talk about some of the difficult phrases here. Um, the the word principle. Just make sure everybody's going to understand this. Um, I'm just going to pull it up in my contemporary dictionary because I pull it up in the OED and it's the same. First in order of importance, Maine, the country's principal cities. That's the new Oxford American Dictionary. I think that is the same sense being used here. And in this case, again, though, we're not talking about Maine as far as all uses of the Bible whatsoever, but Maine in time of divine service. It's a narrow statement. And then not justly to be accepted against. I looked that up in the Oxford English Dictionary. I'm going to pull that up on the screen here. And if you look, you can see sense 2A, to make objection, to object, or take exception. Okay, that I, I think is how you need to read this. When you see uh, not justly to be accepted against, we wouldn't say it that way. Right. And we'd say something like, um, people would not have just reasons or fair reasons to take exception to this particular translation. And I think you kind of have to follow that up with a historical circumstance in, you know, to be understood elliptically, that is not justly to be accepted against for the kinds of uses that we're saying this is going to be put to. Those are probably the most difficult as far as the English goes, but then actually I have a question about one other phrase in here, and then we can get onto the history and then probably be done. But look at that parenthetical, parenthetical expression. Okay, truly good Christian reader, we never thought from the beginning that we should need to make a new translation, nor yet to make of a bad one a good one. For then the imputation of Sixtus had been true in some sort, that our people have been fed with gall of dragons instead of wine, with whey instead of milk. What does that parenthetical mean? Who is Sixtus, and what imputation was he making? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, so Pope Sixtus V had uh, urged and produced the 16 uh, Vulgate, an, an edition of the Latin Vulgate that came out in 1590. It actually didn't last very long. Um, I think 1592 or something like that, it was replaced. It was not a long-lasting edition. Uh, but in that edition, he included a papal bull in the front of it. It's in Latin, and my Latin's not great. But one of the things that he says in that multiple-page um, document, he complains about Protestant editions of the Scripture, and he was suggesting that Satan, I'm going to just quote directly from probably a poor translation. You could handle the Latin better than I do, but this is the best I've got at the moment. Satan had caused that, quote, some of the most corrupt editions of the sacred Bibles would come out, and thus impiety under the figure of piety would be scorned, and slag would be pressed upon the people for silver, dragon's gall for wine, and slag or whey for milk. In other words, he's attacking Protestant translations of the Bible and saying they're corrupt, they think they're eating solid, good, meaty food, and they're actually eating mythical poison. Um, uh. And so Smith takes that up and says, well, well is that true? Are we going to say all our translations were bad? Right. If all our prior translations were bad translations, then he would be right. But they weren't because right. translations don't have to be perfect 
to still to function good. as an authoritative good word of God. Yeah. This is just so important, so important. And it's a theme that comes up repeatedly in the preface, you know, in answer to the uh, invitations of our adversaries. Um, mm. The King James translators are in multiple ways saying, okay, we judge a translation by its predominant character. Just mm. like a man can still be considered handsome, even, even if he had some warts on his hand and yea, even on his face. And they'll say uh, elsewhere that um, th they're concerned about people saying, well, what were the people, you know, reading before? If you're having to revise mm. it, does that mean that what they had before was was wicked? This is the very same argument they're making here. I mean, yep. th this just seems to be top of mind for Miles Smith. Uh, yeah. And here he's actually revealing the very directly by name, the person and therefore the party, the Roman Catholic party, that is making mm -hmm. this charge. So right. imputation here is uh, not the word we would use. We would just say for them, the charge of Sixtus right. would, would have been true that our people had been fed on poison. Yeah, the, the historical uh, circumstances surrounding this are so helpful for understanding. I, I recently, at your recommendation, because you were on the channel, you recommended that Gerald Bray book full of uh, oh, prefaces. Yeah. And I bought it and I was reading it and I have another video coming out soon on it. Oh, I read wow. the 1582 preface to the Dewey Reams. Mm. Um, and that absolutely did help me put the, uh, the King James preface into proper context. Yeah, okay, yeah. I really think we've accomplished what, I, I, what we need to accomplish for this. But if I know Tim Berg, there's a couple other little historical tidbits that are bouncing around in his head. And maybe I want to <laughs> give you a chance, Tim, to get those out before we finish up. What else do, you, do we need to know to have an accurate understanding of this particular phrase? Anything? Um, I, I might quote from just one other document. Um, so when it came to the Hampton Court Conference, scholars have typically studied that conference through the lens of just two or three documents. I think the most I ever found in one guy was he studied it through five. Um, and that's a really recent Oxford uh, Dictionary of National Biography entry by Ken Fincham. Um, but in reality, I've studied through a bunch of old documents, dug through some of the libraries in Europe, and I've counted over 24 accounts of the Hampton Court Conference that were contemporary by eyewitnesses, wow. people that were there or around it. Lots and lots of them, lots of agreement between them, sometimes phrased differently. Like for example, if you've read Barlow, uh, the, the famous one that most people cite today, it's different than what we just read from Patrick Galloway. Um, but I will read just one other that's titled A Memorial of Some Principal Matters uh, to be considered of by the Lords and the Privy Council, dated 1604. Here's what was decided, quote, that care be taken, that one uniform translation of the Bible be printed and read in the church, and that without any notes, end quote. And again, we have to realize, in a Church of England context, the phrase read in the church doesn't mean everything you do in the church. It doesn't mean what Bible you're going to preach from every time, what you're always going to quote. It's referring to the church reading of scripture in the scripted liturgy. So just one more of what literally would be dozens if we were to take them all one at a time people who were present saying, here's what was decided. There was going to be, quote, one uniform translation, meaning one Bible chosen for the scripted liturgy that would be in the Book of Common Prayer. And also, fascinating story, I should have mentioned this earlier, the King James Bible, because the Book of Common Prayer got revised in 1604, before the King James Bible was done, they worked with that edition of the Book of Common Prayer until 1662, after the English Civil Wars and the Restoration. And it wasn't until 1662 when the King James Bible was officially put into the Book of Common Prayer. So James's goal and plan for it wow. didn't happen for decades. Um, and oh even my. to this day, in 1662 and later, even to this day, they never replaced the Psalms reading. The Psalms, with the, the KJV. Coverdale. That's Wasn't right. They loved that Coverdale. Used? Yeah, it was cover Coverdale via the Great Bible. Uh, but yeah, they loved Coverdale's wording so much that even to this day, when you pick up a Book of Common Prayer or you're in an uh, Anglican Communion church that follows the Book of Common Prayer liturgy, you're reading essentially Coverdale's words, not the King James's. So in, in one very real sense, the King James Bible failed at its most <laughs> intended uh, ambition. The one thing James set out for it to do, and I think he probably had several things for it to do, but the yeah. one main thing he had set out for it to do, it didn't accomplish at all until the 60s. And it really never com accomplished completely, which isn't, I don't, when I call the King James Bible a failure, I don't mean I don't right, love it. Right. And I, I'm grateful for it. Read it all the time. I got married using it as the text uh, and the BCP as our marriage um, vows. Love the King James Bible, but it was a failure in terms of its intended political ambitions for sure. Right. You know, so, so let's make sure to end this, uh, lest anybody who got this far think that we're trying to <laughs> 
put down the King James Version, it actually succeeded in something that's proven to be far more important. To right. I mean, it, just just judging by the sheer number of people who've been influenced by the King James Version. Um, yeah. I'm glad that it succeeded in that way, and I think provided a wonderful tradition on which we can build and actually are building. Uh, and one of the ways in which we can, I mean, one of the constant messages of my channel is that to to really honor the King James translators is it it's not to say they all learned Greek and Hebrew when they were three. Um, <laughs> it's to say let's uphold the principles that they upheld. Mm. And how do we yeah. know what they did? Well, what principles they held? Well, we can look. We can look at how formal versus how functional were they. That's one thing we can uphold. And in general, I tend to like to do that. Um, though I'm happy to use more uh, functional translations as well from all kinds of reasons. But then we can also uphold the principles that are stated in the preface. And in order to do that, we have to have a proper historical understanding of that preface. And I think we've made a great stab in that direction. Thank you so much, Tim. It's such a great uh, great privilege to have you as a friend mm -hmm. and a co-laborer in this effort to get people to um, uh, to get people to appreciate what what goes into Bible translation, so they can make excellent and careful and doctrinally sound uses of good English Bible translations. Thank you again so much yeah. for your time, Tim. Yep, yeah, absolutely.